connecting point. Uh, we're back again with the second to last uh, sermon on our, in our Judges series. I want to start by zooming out so that we can see where we are in the trajectory of, Israelite, of the Israelite story. So in the book of Exodus, the nation of Israel was living under the oppressive rule of a foreign nation. Sound familiar? Yahweh calls up a deliverer, Moses, to lead Israel into battle, wherein Yahweh does all the work. The oppressor, oppressive ruler is defeated, and Israel is led into a time of peace. This sounds familiar to us because it's very much like our judges' stories that we've been going through. And when we zoom out to see the larger story, we actually see Moses as our first judge. For Exodus through Deuteronomy, we have Yahweh on the scene, and he uh, himself is set up as king over his chosen people, Israel. Yahweh appoints leaders and elders and officials and tribes. Yahweh is the one who sets out the law for all to follow, and the people respond with a commitment to obey Yahweh. Then at the end of the book of Joshua, the tribes are assembled together again to commit to Yahweh as Lord. Then we enter the book of Judges. In the first couple of chapters, we were reminded of Israel's failure to possess the land, which they were given as an inheritance. And the author then gave us a prelude to the rest of the stories of uh, the 12 judges, sorry, the rest of the story by describing for us the pattern of sin, judgment, and restoration. Then we moved through the stories of the 12 judges. And these were intended to give us a picture of the overall state of the 12 tribes of Israel. In those stories, we saw how that pattern played out, um, how Israel uh, again and again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Yahweh handed them over to their own desires, then Israel would cry out for help, and Yahweh would send a deliverer. This pattern happened over and over with the nation of Israel, and they experienced a steady decline, uh, both spiritually and morally, in their commitment to follow Yahweh as king. I was really moved these last few weeks hearing the stories of Samson and Ruth, and we saw even when Israel was actively working against Yahweh and his redeeming work, Yahweh still remained faithful. And now, as we're entering this third and final section of the book of Judges, um, we understand that Yahweh is faithful, even when we are not. This is an important foundation for us to, to, fall, to stand on as we enter these final stories, where the author is going to illustrate for us the extent to which Israel will follow in their own way in rejecting Yahweh. And we are going to see more than ever Israel's uh, need for an absence of a deliverer. Let's read together in chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And it just jumps right in from Samson's story to almost like you're in the middle of a whole new story. Uh, let's start here. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, The eleven hundred pieces that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears. Well, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the eleven hundred pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now therefore I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took two hundred pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah, and the, Micah, the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod, and household gods, and ordained one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. All right, so already we're off to a good start. Let's do a quick table talk for fun, and just in those first five verses, can you count how many of the Ten Commandments Micah has violated? 
Well, Micah has only violated about six of the Ten Commandments. His mother is quickly trying to undo her curse, which she had uttered about the thief when after, until after she found out that the thief was her son. Then she tries to appease God by dedicating the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son. So she had 1,100 pieces of silver, which was a large sum of money, and then actually offers only 200. And this offering then produces for Micah a shrine, an ephod, some household gods, and his own personal priest, also known as his son. Let's take a quick look at these, uh, these different items. So first of all, a shrine, setting up personal place of worship was against God's law. Yahweh is the one who gets to decide where and how and when worship should take place. An ephod is a holy garment meant for a priest to wear in service to Yahweh in the place that Yahweh designates for worship. This mention of Micah making an ephod should remind us of the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 8, wherein after Yahweh delivered Israel from the Midianites, the Israelites asked Gideon to be their king. And he said, oh, no, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But then he proceeded to behave like a king and collect an offering from them. And then he turned that offering into an ephod, set it up, and the nation ended up worshiping it. It was a bad thing. It became a snare to Gideon and his family. And so this reminder of, that, of Gideon's story would serve to... Um, to remind us of the problems that come when we choose to define spirituality on our own terms. On household gods he made, kind of looked at that probably when you talked about the uh, Ten Commandments, the do not make an idol for yourself, do not have any gods before me, and then a priest. A priest is a man from the tribe of Levi, from the line of Aaron, uh, someone who is appointed by Yahweh and set aside, set apart for service to Yahweh. In other words, uh, Micah's son is none of those things. <laughs> so we see Micah and his mom just taking what they like from Israel, their Israelite heritage, taking what they like from the pagan worship around them in the surrounding areas, and then just mash it up to make their own spirituality. And the author interjects here with a brief commentary in verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. So at the beginning, I reminded us about in the story of Israel, Yahweh has set himself up as king and Israel agreed to follow Yahweh. So Yes, this is a time period of the judges before the kings, and that statement, there is no king in Israel, could be referring to that fact. However, I think we can also read into that statement that this was an appeal by the author to return to their king Yahweh and abandon their pagan worship. Let's continue with our text. Verse 7. Now there was a young man in Bethlehem in Judah of the tribe of of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there, and a man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? He said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, and a suit of clothes, and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Oh, now I know that the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as a priest. It's interesting that in this chapter, the only character that is named is Micah. And Micah means who is like Yahweh. Clearly, Micah knows who is like Yahweh because Micah has created his own virtual reality wherein Micah gets to decide what is right and what is true. But it seems that Micah thinks that Micah is like Yahweh. <laughs> what do we know about this sojourner? So he was a Levite, 
That's at least one feather in his cap, one of the qualifications of being a priest. He was young though. The text mentions his youth three times. In, according to the law, uh, a man must be at least 30 years old in order to be ordained as a priest. And you don't get ordained by some random guy you just met. <laughs> He was sojourning in Judah, which turns out that's not where he was supposed to be. And he was planning to sojourn meh, wherever he could find a place. Sounds an awful lot like doing what is right in your own eyes. And he is happy to pretend to be a priest for Micah in exchange for room and board. So he's quite the character, a real winner. But now Micah, in his little virtual reality, picking and choosing what commandments are convenient for him, now he's confident that the Lord will prosper him. Let's remember back to the lessons of Samson and Ruth. Uh, we know that Yahweh is faithful even when we are not faithful. God will build his kingdom with or without us. However, like Micah, we must not presume upon God's grace in our circumstances one of the commentators said it like this, if we abandon his commandments and pursue the idols of our own imagination, the result will be moral and spiritual chaos. And that's exactly what we're about to see in Micah's life and let it be a warning for us. Let's pick up in chapter 18, verse one. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then they had no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. And when they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite, and they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He's hired me, and I've become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtael, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. The author mentions again that there is no king in Israel, an appeal for the nation to turn to their true king, Yahweh. This is followed by the sad story of the Danites. We're really sorry from them, aren't we, that they don't have an inheritance? But that's not true. If we recall back to Judges chapter 1, we saw the failure of many of the tribes, including the tribe of Dan, to possess the land. In Dan's case, the Amorites forced them into the hill country, and they didn't push back. So the truth is, not that Dan had no inheritance, but that they were unwilling to fight for what the Lord had given to them. And just like the Levite in chapter 17, the Danites were seeking a land that seemed good to them rather than the allotment that Yahweh had assigned them. Again, we hear echoes of the author's statement, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This story is told in such a way that it reminds us of Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, sending spies into the promised land back in Numbers 13 and 14. Moses had sent spies into the land to report back whether the land was good, and 10 of the 12 spies reported that while the land was good, the people in the land were too strong. So Israel refused to take possession of the land and even wanted to kill Moses and Aaron and select a new leader to take them back to Egypt. 
And we can see here the parallels between these two stories as a warning sign that Dan is headed down a bad path away from Yahweh leading to spiritual bondage. The spies in the story recognized the Levite. It probably was just that they recognized his accent was out of place in that area and probably they didn't know him personally beforehand. When the spies learn that he is a priest to Micah, they say, inquire of God on our behalf. I found out and I found it helpful to learn that they were referring uh, not to Yahweh specifically, but to uh, any God. <laughs> so, However, the Levite, without missing a beat or inquiring of the Lord, he responds to them, go in peace. The journey on which you enter is under the eye of Yahweh. So the Levite is using the Lord's name to suit his own purposes. This is about people pleasing. This scene is not about Yahweh showing up and offering his input. The story then continues to unravel as the spies return to the tribe and convince the Danites to take up their weapons, pack up the kids, and take what they want from quiet and unsuspecting people. The first of which is Micah. As the army travels through to Laish, they stop again at Micah's house. This time it's not to stay the night, it's to do what seems right in their own eyes. Let's pick up in verse 18. When the, and when they went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They said to him, Keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth, and come with us, and be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man, or to be a priest of a, to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people, so they turned and departed, putting the little ones in the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said to them, You take my gods that I made and the priest and go away. What do I have left? And how do you ask me what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had, and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the sword, the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it. And they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up a carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Throughout the book of Judges, we've seen foreign nations oppressing the Israelites and Israel in need of a deliverer. Did you notice what shifted in this story? The Israelite tribe... Dan took what Micah had, they turned to a land which was well outside the promised inheritance to a quiet and unsuspecting people. They struck them, they burned their city, and in verse 28 it says, there was no deliverer. What's happened to our, our cast of characters, the tribe of Dan, these poor oppressed Danites become the oppressors and they've set up a city which is centered around idolatry and it's idolatry that will eventually lead the nation into exile. Micah has nothing now that the gods that he's created have been taken away from him. Don't press that for logic because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> 
and Micah has ultimately experienced the curse that his mother had spoken over the thief because the very thing that he had stolen has now been stolen from him. Then we find out the Levite, Jonathan, is from the line of Moses, not from the line of Aaron, and he is happy as a clam with his promotion that he got. We could connect ourselves with each of these characters, however, I want to focus in on Dan with the table talk. The tribe of Dan believed the lie that what God has asked of me is too hard. I want what that person has, what that looks good to me. In what ways do we fall into that same trap? Okay, we still have one more chapter to go. <laughs> Let's get reading. Chapter 19, verse 1. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there for some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. So this woman was a concubine. A concubine is a woman with a social status that's a little bit higher than a slave, but lower than that of a wife. She was the legal property of her master. Now you can imagine for yourself how concubines were treated in that time. I won't spell it out for you. It says in verse two that she was unfaithful to him. This verb could also be translated that she was angry with him or that she despised him. We don't know about this guy too much from this point in the story, but I'll give you a spoiler alert, he is a slime ball. And in the context of the larger story, I think it makes more sense to see her character as someone who is fleeing from an abusive relationship. It is far less likely that she was the abuser here. She is absent and silent for most of the story while her father shows the Levite a ridiculous amount of hospitality. The father keeps asking the Levite to stay longer and longer and the father's reception offers a very stark contrast to the next scene. The Levite and his concubine finally leave the father's house to return home, but then they have to stop for the night in Gibeah, which belongs to the Benjaminites. They found it very difficult to find lodging, but eventually met a man who was also from the hill country of Ephraim, and were, was brought, they were brought into his house. We'll pick up in verse 22. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the Levite seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning and when he opened the doors of the house and went to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on his donkey. And the man rose up and went his away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife Taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, Such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. What Old Testament story does this remind you of? This scene 
is nearly note-for-note -note remake of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read about the similarities in Genesis 19, but I want to highlight some of the differences here. First of all, the perverted men of the town were not pagans. They were Israelites. They were God's chosen people. Secondly, there was no reckoning at daybreak for the injustice that took place in that city. And thirdly, the Levite got up from his rest to be on his way. He slept easy that night. And if he had not nearly tripped over the woman's body as he went out the door, who knows if he would have ever given her a second thought. Keep in mind that he is the one who seized her and made her go out to them. She is his property, and he can do with her whatever seems right in his own eyes. This is difficult stuff, church. This is why no one wants to do a sermon series on the book of Judges. And guess what? That's not the worst of it. It actually gets worse next week. This chapter that we have today ends with a woman in pieces. And the next one ends with a nation in pieces. The author is doing a very good job of communicating what happens when there is no king. When every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Israel desperately needs a deliverer. The reason we study the book of Judges is when we allow ourselves to see what happens when there is no king, these depths of spiritual and moral corruption and these natural consequences of being given over to our own desires, when we see that, the cross of Jesus comes into vivid clarity. Israel's pursuit of their own desires leads them on a downward spiral of bad decisions resulting in the destruction of their fellow Israelites. Jesus is a stand-in for Israel. It wasn't the Romans that demanded Jesus be executed. It was the Israelites. What do we need to take from this? The nation of Israel is indistinguishable from the pagan nations around them. Church, what is different about us? What makes following Jesus distinct from any other spirituality? We'll take some time to pray for one another. Have a great week.